And now hear the word of the Lord from Hebrews chapter 12. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Morning, Sojourn. Peace be with you. Another election day has come and gone. And as is true after most elections, there are those in our country who are thrilled with the results and others who are devastated by them and everything in between. And in presidential election years, this is the season that we can expect at least a few famous folks to threaten to move to Canada. <laughs> the attraction of our northern neighbor, at least for part of the electorate, dates as far back as 1999 when George W. Bush was elected for his first term. And since then, celebrities from Snoop Dogg to Barbara Streisand have declared that they would move across the border if their candidate lost. None that we know of have followed through. But would you believe if I told you that regular citizens are actually moving to Canada in greater numbers? Statistics reveal since 2015, there has been a steady increase in the number of people from the United States who were granted permanent residence in Canada in each successive year. And in fact, in 2021, the number of successful U.S. applicants reached the highest annual total since at least 1980. Those Americans choosing to head north use words like scared and hopeless to describe their motivation as they consider our nation. One writer, noting that political conservatives didn't have a Canadian equivalent to which to flee, wrote an entire article suggesting the likes of Poland, the Cayman Islands, Switzerland, and Australia as options. Now listen to Pastor Tim Keller's commentary on this trend. This is what he writes. He says, one of the signs that an object is functioning as an idol is that fear becomes one of the chief characteristics of life. When we center our lives on the idol, we become dependent on it. If our counterfeit God is threatened in any way, our response is complete panic. We do not say, what a shame, how difficult, but rather, this is the end, there's no hope. This may be a reason why so many people now respond to U.S. political threats in such an extreme way. When either party wins an election, a certain percentage of the losing side talks openly about leaving the country. They become agitated and fearful for the future. They've put the kind of hope in their political leaders and policies that, was, that once was reserved for God and the work of the gospel. When their political leaders are out of power, they experience a death. They believe if, believe if their policies and people are not in power, everything will fall apart. Keller wrote those words in 2009, and things have only gotten worse, much worse. As Christians, how do we avoid making idols out of our preferred policies, parties, or political leaders? 
And as the unstable ground of our divided nation continues to shift, how do we find a firm foundation for our own faithful feet? Our passage for this morning, Hebrews 12, verses 18 to 29, provides an answer. Two weeks ago, Paul walked us through Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, a sampling of Old Testament saints who finished their journey well. Last week, Dodds preached the first half of this chapter, chapter 12, and he brought to life the powerful picture of the church as a multi-generational caravan journeying together in faith. And it's here in the latter half of chapter 12 that the destination for this faithful profession comes into focus. The author uses two mountains to represent two very different covenants. One leads to death and the other life. The untouchable, unshakable kingdom of God. And these mountains are two options for where we can plant our flag of faith. And Christ's call in these verses is to receive his unshakable kingdom with grateful worship. The structure for this passage is a comparison of these two mountains followed by three encouragements for God's people. Two mountains, three encouragements. So let's consider the first mountain together starting in verse 18. For you have not come to what may be touched a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Now, as we've mentioned repeatedly throughout our study in Hebrews, this letter was originally addressed to Jews who were facing persecution for professing their faith in Christ. And this harassment was putting a steady squeeze on them to forsake Jesus and return to the ritual practices of what we now call the Mosaic Law. And it's called the Mosaic Law because God delivered the law to Israel through its mediator, Moses. Mosaic Law for Moses. And there are five places in Hebrews where the author's pleading turns to stern warning of the danger associated with leaving Christ and the covering of his blood and the eternal safety of the new covenant. And our text this morning is the fifth and final of these so-called warning passages. Now throughout his writing, the author has used vivid metaphor and imagery from the Old Testament to make this case that Jesus is better. He continues that trend here as he presents to his readers two mountains. And the first mountain is clearly Mount Sinai, the mountain where the Lord delivered the law to his people through Moses thousands of years before, prior to the writing of this very letter. And we're planning a series next year on the Ten Commandments where we'll look more carefully at God's giving of the law to Israel. But for now, it's sufficient for us to recall this event just briefly. The Lord first appeared to Moses in a burning bush at Mount Sinai, also called Mount Horeb, and he promised that he would deliver his beloved people out of slavery in Egypt and he would bring them uh, to worship him at this mountain. And in a demonstration of his sovereign power over creation, God then brought 10 plagues on Egypt and then he miraculously parted the Red Sea to free his, the Israelites from bondage. And just as he promised, he led them to Sinai in the wilderness. And the description of Sinai in these verses revisits that it was an assault on the census. I want you to listen to Exodus 19, starting with verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. And then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire, and the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Visually, there was 
a gloomy, stormy darkness pierced by the fire, so often associated with God's appearances. And the smoke from the fire filled their nostrils and stuck to their clothes. Trumpet blasts pierced their ears, and the very voice of the Lord himself led them to shudder and cower in fear. The earth shook. The atmosphere was clearly disturbed. Imagine violent gusts of wind whipping around the mountain. This was a violent event. And God instructed the people not to touch the mountain. Only Moses could ascend it. Not even animals could touch the mountain, for any living thing that touched it would be put to death. It was terrifying. And when Moses later recalls the events of Sinai in Deuteronomy 18, verse 16, he remembers the people's cries, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. Ordinary Israelites were utterly terrified by the experience. And the author of Hebrews recounts how even Moses, their leader, was terrified too. Especially after the people construct the golden calf, Moses trembles in fear that the Lord might destroy every last one of his people. Why does the author go through the trouble of recounting this frightful visitation of the Lord to his people? Well, he's reminding the Hebrews of the great and terrifying and fearful nature of the Mosaic Covenant to which they're tempted to return. And in the first part of this chapter, the author has painted the picture of his readers as a multi-generational caravan, to borrow Dodd's incredibly helpful phrase. They're running the race of faith together. They're in community. They're supporting and encouraging one another, ensuring that they cross the finish line together. And he's telling them, he's reminding them, you have not come back to Sinai. This race that you're running together does not lead back to the Mosaic law. It does not end in the tempestuous terror and fright associated with the strict obedience demanded by the old covenant. And the way that we know he's saying this is because he introduces a contrast at the beginning of verse 22 as he turns to remind them of their true destination, a different mountain, a better mountain, when he writes, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Two mountains One, Mount Sinai, represents the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Law. And he now identifies the other mountain as Mount Zion. What is the significance of this mountain, and why does the author now refer to it? Occurring over 150 times in the Bible, the word Zion first appears in 2 Samuel 5, 7, which tells us that King David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. Zion was originally an ancient Jebusite fortress in what would eventually become the city of Jerusalem. And when David conquered the fortress, he built his royal palace there on an associated high hill called Mount Zion. And this made Jerusalem the seat of political power in Israel. And when David's own son Solomon built the first Jewish temple on Mount Zion, Jerusalem became Israel's religious center too. Throughout the Old Testament, Zion referred varyingly to the temple, the city of Jerusalem, the land of Judah, and the nation of Israel as a whole. But most consistently, Zion is synonymous with Jerusalem, God's special city, a a place marked by his affection. Psalm 87 opens with these words, On the holy mount stands the city he founded. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things of you are spoken, O city of God. In the Gospels of the New Testament, the word Zion takes an additional important meaning when Jesus is crucified just outside the city walls of Jerusalem. And specifically here in Hebrews 12, the author uses Mount Zion to describe a spiritual kingdom— the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. 
Just listen to all the things associated with Zion. Look at verse 22 again. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. There are two mountains. But the author is reminding his readers, Hebrews, you have not come to Sinai. Instead, you've come to the glories of Mount Zion and the tremendous blessings of the new covenant. The contrast between these two mountains is stark, even staggering. And to emphasize the difference, he lists six blessings, six privileges associated with following Christ, starting with innumerable angels in festal gatherings. So often when we find angels in the Bible, we find them worshiping God in his heavenly throne room. And so the race that the Hebrews are running is accompanied by joy-filled praises of countless heavenly beings. But there aren't just angels in heaven. There are people there too. God's chosen, beloved saints, the cloud of witnesses mentioned earlier in the chapter. And they're described here as the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. And then the spirits of the righteous made perfect. These are God's justified people, no longer marked by sin, but glorified and fit for his holy presence. And what would heaven be without God himself, the judge of all, and Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant? Because what makes Zion so glorious is the presence of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who created it in the first place. And then he mentions a final association with Zion, the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. What on earth does this mean? Well, Abel, we know, was the son of Adam and Eve. And after the Lord showed his pleasure with the sacrifice that Abel had offered in faith, he was murdered in cold blood by his own jealous brother, Cain. And the Lord responded to Cain in Genesis 4 by asking him, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And then the hall of faith in Hebrews 11 opens with the example of Abel. He's the first person listed in the hall of faith. When the writer says, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Abel's blood cried out from the ground. On one hand, his blood cried out for God's justice against sin, but on the other, it cried out as a testimony of his own faith in God as demonstrated by the righteous sacrifice that he had offered to God. Moses promised in Deuteronomy 18 that another would be coming to speak to God's people. Deuteronomy 18.15, Moses says to the people of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord, your God, at Horeb, on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. It was true that that the people could not bear the transcendent voice of God without a mediator. And so the Lord promises a prophet, a mediator greater than Moses. And this is why we find people, particularly in the Gospel of John, asking one another, "Is, is he the prophet? That is, the prophet that Moses promised in Deuteronomy 18? And the answer is that he most certainly was and he most certainly is. And in this prophecy from Moses in Deuteronomy 18, he says to the people of Israel, including the Hebrews who first read this letter, it is to him you shall listen. 
But Jesus wasn't merely a prophet who spoke the very words of God. As we've seen throughout the majority of this letter, Jesus was the great high priest in the order of Melchizedek who would offer himself as the suitable, unblemished, once-for-all sacrifice for his people. And the blood that he shed did not merely demonstrate his faithfulness in death like Abel, but his blood achieved forgiveness for all, for all who would believe in him. And here we see the theme of Hebrews repeated once again, better. Jesus is better. Jesus is greater. Jesus is superior. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than Joshua. He's better than the Levitical priests in the order of Aaron. And he's better than Abel. The blood of this slain prophet speaks a better word than Abel's. Abel's blood communicates the need for justice, the need for salvation. But Jesus' blood assures justice for those who refuse it and secures salvation for all who will receive it. There are two mountains in these verses, and we should make no mistake that the heavenly Mount Zion is greater than Mount Sinai. The image of Sinai reminds us that God's holiness makes him utterly unapproachable by sinful people, at least without a mediator. But the image of Zion reminds us that Jesus' work as a greater prophet, a greater priest, a greater mediator who shed his greater blood has made a way for his people to be ushered into the very presence of God. Why would anyone ever return to Sinai? Why would you ever be tempted to give up on Jesus and the covenant he established through his blood? What on earth could be better than the blessings that he's listed and all the others that come with it? Most especially, God himself. By presenting this crystal clear contrast, though brief, these are the questions before the Hebrews and us. And with these two mountains presented as potential destinations for the caravan of faith, the author now turns to his three encouragements in verse 25. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The first encouragement for us is do not refuse him who is speaking. And this is where the warning so clearly emerges, this fifth and final warning. And there's an urgency, there's an edge to this encouragement. See to it that you don't refuse him. Be certain not to to resist him. Make sure that you don't ignore him. And the one speaking to us is God himself from heaven. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, he delivered his law along with covenant curses that would fall on all those who disobeyed it. These were curses like famine and failed crops and defeat in battle. And the Exodus generation refused him and they did not enter his rest. They would not escape. And if that's the case, the, argue, the author argues, how much greater will the punishment be for those of us who refuse his voice after Christ's death and resurrection? We already know that he's come. God has already provided the once-for-all sacrifice in his son and declared who he is and what we should do with him. That's the one offering for our iniquity. There is no other solution for our sin than Jesus. And if the Jewish believers refuse his voice and return to the demands of the law, they will be punished under the law. And the law offers no hope. It offers no salvation. It merely highlights our very clear need for a Savior. So what about you? Have you listened to God's voice calling to you through the blood of his own son Jesus? Or have you refused it? This is a strong warning from God about his coming judgment over all creation. The day of the Lord is always imminent for us. 
the Lord will visit us once again. And the scriptures call it a day of wrath, the great day of the Lord Almighty. But it's also a day when God will spare those who have hidden themselves under the shelter of Christ. Throw yourself at his mercy today so that you might look forward to that day in great anticipation for the Lord's salvation and not fear of his wrath against sin. God shook the earth at Sinai. Verse 26, And yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This quotation comes from two different references in Haggai chapter 2. And twice in that chapter, God promises to shake the heavens and the earth on a future date that has not yet come. And by this he means that he will judge all the nations of the world, including the United States, including Canada, and including Switzerland. He will dethrone their rulers and destroy their military might. And he will then rule through his chosen servant, a king from the line of David. And we now know that king to be King Jesus. See to it that you do not refuse God's voice. Do not refuse Jesus' voice. He is a prophet, priest, and king. He is the prophet, priest, and king. And he's established a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Verse 27. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And here's the second encouragement. Let us be grateful for God's unshakable kingdom. God shook the earth at Sinai, and he promised us to shake all of creation on that coming day, the day of the Lord. And those kingdoms and countries and nations that are shaken will not remain, but that which cannot be shaken, the kingdom of God will remain, and people from every nation, tribe, and tongue will be a part of that glorious kingdom. We've been saved by the king so that we might live with God forever. We are his sons and daughters. We have direct access to his throne room through his son. Only when we truly understand what Jesus has done can we truly be grateful. And gratitude will have a transformative effect on our souls. It protects us from discouragement and unbelief. Thankfulness strengthens our faith because when times get tough, we can draw from the well of God's past faithfulness. We remember all that he's done, both what he's revealed to us in the precious pages of this book, but also what he's done in our own lives. This is why it's so important for us to know the word and to study the word, because we, there are times where we have to draw on what uh, he's told us so that we might believe and have faith. There are far more people who want to move to our country than there are those who want to leave it. And if you've ever experienced a naturalization ceremony before, then you will know exactly what gratitude looks like. There's a special palpable joy and excitement and thankfulness in any courtroom where people are becoming citizens of our difficult but wonderful nation. There's beautiful traditional garb from homelands. American flags are waving and plenty of joyful tears and happy photos and heartfelt hugs. But as much as we associate gratitude with naturalized citizens, uh, David French asserts a simple proposition, and I'm quoting him. He writes, the people who did exactly nothing to become citizens of the greatest nation in the history of the earth should be among the most grateful people on this planet. He's referring to those that were born here. We should be grateful to those who gave their last full measure of devotion to defend our nation and our constitution, appropriate as we celebrate Veterans Day. And he writes, we should be grateful for those who endure great hardship to defend our liberty, safety, and prosperity. And yet, he continues, all too many native-born citizens forsake the moral obligations of citizen citizenship and instead focus only on reaping its considerable legal and constitutional benefits. I would suggest there's a similar danger with our citizenship in God's kingdom. We've done 
exactly nothing to become its citizens. We are citizens by grace and grace alone. We just sang that. And that can lead us to take it for granted. But instead, we should be known for an irrepressible gratitude that guards our souls and protects us from the enemy's temptations toward apathy and bitterness and even embarrassment for being a part of his kingdom. So consider taking time this week as a family or maybe even make it a regular tradition or in your parish just to take time to pray prayers of thanksgiving. Just popcorn style around the table to offer up simple prayers of what you're thankful for as you think of God's glorious citizenship in his unshakable kingdom. You'll pray for a while. You won't exhaust them, but it's a wonderful way simply to give God thanks and to acknowledge the wonderful blessing it is to be a part of his kingdom and to enjoy his salvation. The, The encouragement here is let us be grateful for God's unshakable kingdom. There's a third and final encouragement that comes at the end of verse 28. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. We should respond to our citizenship with gratitude and with worship, and not just any worship, but reverent and awe-filled worship. Now, one of the cultural differences that I've noticed in moving from D.C. to Houston is the casual vibe of the city. In many ways, it's been wonderfully refreshing. The city is casual. This neighborhood is casual. And that can even extend to the friendly, casual ethos of our church family. But I think this passage is a reminder to us that we should never approach God casually. We should never take God casually. May we never approach him lightly, but instead acknowledge the the heaviness of his holiness. May we always give him the proper respect that he's due as the sovereign Lord of heaven and earth. There are two mountains and three encouragements in this passage, and yet there's one God. There's one God in this passage as revealed in his Bible, and he never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The Lord of Zion is the Lord of Sinai. The only difference, and it's a profound one, is our covering by Jesus' blood. Jesus' finished work is what allows us to draw close to the one true God in reverent worship. As we were thinking about this passage together this week, Dodds brought up the helpful analogy of the sun. If we were to approach the sun, it would incinerate us. But that doesn't make the sun bad. God's holiness is what makes him unapproachable because of our sin. He dwells in unapproachable light. He is a consuming fire. It does not say he was a consuming fire. It says he is a consuming fire. But Jesus' sacrifice appeases his Father's wrath. He becomes our shield, the shade on our right hand. And his righteousness applied to us gives us direct, intimate access to the unapproachable God. And so the nature of our fear changes. We no longer approach God in servile fear, like a servant cowering before a demanding master. Because Jesus has freed us from the penalty of sin. And because God has adopted us into his family. And so we now approach God with awe and respect as his children. And we can be grateful for the Son while still acknowledging its awesome power. Christ's call in this passage is to receive his unshakable kingdom with grateful, awe-filled, reverent worship. And there are two mountains and three encouragements and one awesome, holy God. We must worship him in his holiness. Our worship is not just what we do in this room together, as centrally important as that is, but it's how we construct our calendars. It's how we spend our money. It's how we view authority. 
It's how we prioritize our relationships, not only with fellow members of this church family, but also with those who are far from God so that they might see that our lives are actually different, so that they might hear from our actual lips the good news that they too can have access to the one true God and his unshakable kingdom. It's how we live our lives. Now, people may still choose to move to Canada or some other country. The only problem is that they'll come to see that those nations are broken like our nation is. Those nations are led by sinful, flawed people just like ours is. Those countries have broken systems just like ours does. And no matter where we choose to live, no matter how much persecution we might face, even in this country, we must never forget that one day every country on this earth will be shaken when the Lord judges the nations and when Jesus returns to judge heaven and earth. And his kingdom, his holy city Zion will last forever. It cannot fail. Its citizens find eternal safety and security in her walls. I'm reading a bedtime book with my son Tommy, two years old. And the chapter that I just read with him just the other night was too perfect not to share with you. This is written by Jeremy Pierre, and this is what he writes. A day is coming that will begin with the last dawn, so powerful and clear, it will end nighttime forever. Those who belong to Jesus will awake to find that darkness was just a passing thing. That eternal morning, pure as winter and warm as summer, mature as autumn and fresh as spring, had always been their home, for they were children of the light, children of God. That bright tomorrow will end the terrible separation that sent you out of the first garden, for this day dawns on a new garden, a garden that is a city and also a better temple, a better country, a holy mountain, a new earth, and a new heaven. And guess what? It's ours. It's ours. It's ours now and it's ours forever. All because of Christ. And it's on this mountain in this perfect heavenly city that our Lord will gather his people and stand with us in victory. His victory. So brothers and sisters, let us receive this unshakable kingdom now. Today. And respond to his gracious offer of citizenship with grateful, reverent, awe-filled worship and praise. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Oh God, we, we, have, we have no other response other than to be thankful for what you've done. When we see this contrast of what we could turn to and what you have given to us through your son Jesus, I pray for every single one of us, that we would just pour out our lives in praise. I pray that we would not refuse your voice calling to us from heaven, and I pray that our lives would be transformed by your word here to us now on this day. And I pray that our congregation, every person who's here, that we would be marked by reverent, awe-filled worship of you the one true God, a consuming fire who's made a way for us to live with him forever. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.